Thank you okay. very much, uh, Benjamin. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, participants. Uh, I'm sharing my few slides. Uh, I hope that you are seeing it now. Benjamin, can you confirm it? Yes, that's okay. okay. We, can see, we can see it. You can uh, start the slide. Yeah. That's okay. Perfect. Very Thanks. good. So, so yes. first of all, um, thank you very much. Uh, for yes. Yes. Yes to uh, talk in this uh, site uh, event. So, so uh, my name is Hung Nguyen. Uh, I'm the co-lead of the Animal and Human Health Program and also leading the One CGA uh, One Health Initiative here. And I have the pleasure also to become uh, recently as a host researcher at CIRAT. And also uh, I have been involved in some of the meetings and preparation of preserved uh, uh, in previous uh, months. So in the next few minutes, um, I would, uh, I am, um, yeah, I will talking uh, about setting a bit the scenes on the emergence of infectious diseases and the need to foster intersectoral collaboration uh, to, to prevent, uh, to implement the, the prevention strategies. So this is the to, to topic we agree uh, to, to discuss in the next few minutes. Um, you know, I think that this uh, targeted group we are having today, we are very familiar with the global context of infectious disease diseases, pandemics, One Health, and so on. But the take home message really uh, you know, on this slide coming from our last report published with UNEP last year or two years ago in the middle of the pandemic is in fact, we have the increased uh, frequency of emergence of infectious diseases leading to the pandemic. Uh, uh, and you see the frequencies is increased more and more and actually the COVID-19 we are facing at the moment is only one of, of these important pandemics. And uh, we are sure that thing, uh, more pandemics will come uh, in, in, in future. Um, and of course, you know, most of these pandemics are caused by zoonosis. And actually the zoonosis are the disease transmitted from animals to humans, but you have also kind of reverse zoonosis from human to animals as well. Uh, you know, the key fact is, in fact, you know, really 60% of all these infectious, uh, infectious diseases in humans are uh, have the, the, the zoonotic origin, and about 75% of all emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic as well. Um, and you see almost many challenges in terms of driver and so on. And uh, here I, I want to come back. Uh, some uh, during my talk, I take some of the information coming up, uh, coming from our report between INRI and UNEP. Uh, and actually the lead author is my colleague, Delia Chris, who is at INRI, but also at NI in the UK. Um, so we said that, you know, the future pandemics are inevitable and, and uh, we are, <laughs> we need to be ready for the next one. But the question here is that how to uh, reduce or, uh, you know, how to prevent or at least reduce uh, the, the impact of the next pandemic. And, uh, you know, basically we agree on the key drivers leading to the next pandemics. And here, uh, uh, sort of have group, uh, regroup uh, different drivers in terms of uh, a grouping here. Uh, we can see three major groups of reason for, for, for emergence or geomergence of infectious diseases leading to the pandemic on the first of all is on the demand of animal source food uh, that we are uh, having at the moment. So in the next slide, I show you a bit the demand we, we are having, but with the economic growth, people consume more meat, milk and egg. And that includes the, you know, the, the demand linked to the chain of food supply chain, but also the uncertain, uh, uncertainable agriculture intensification uh, with livestock development. Uh, but also the increased uh, use of wildlife product, uh, but also the degradation of natural environment. So the second group of, of drivers is really linked to the context of uh, globalization in terms of travel, a lot of you know, traveling around the world in terms of trade and transportation. And finally, we talked a lot about the climate change, the demographic change and country changes. So all these things are very challenging to uh, on, on the actually the emissions of, of different types of zoonotic diseases. 
uh, I said before that you know the, the increase uh, uh, the increased demand of animal source food here in terms of meat, milk, and egg uh, are very important uh, for the emergence of, of, of infectious diseases. You can see here uh, the FAO uh, uh, um, prediction in terms of increase of, of animal source food in future uh, between um, here is the status of uh, 2005 and 2030. You can see that all the value chains, all the community of beef, poultry, pork, and milk increase uh, with the various uh, factors up to 200 to 300%, but mostly in developing countries. You look at Asia, Pacific, China, South Asia, Africa, everything is in increased in the next uh, decades. Uh, the consumption of animal source food, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, actually is remain quite stable in high income countries. That is also uh, uh, easy to understand because you know people reach already at the level of about 70 to 100 kilogram of, of meat per, per, per year in uh, OECD country, whereas in Africa it's about 10 kilogram per year. You see the gap. That's why developing countries going to be uh, uh, very important consumers of animal source food. And when, when you look at the livestock density projection uh, in uh, the next decades, you can see that it's most of the important development relate to the developing country in the global south. And there actually is a problem of uh, uh, emergence of infectious disease in, in this area. Uh, when we talked about animal source food consumption and one health, we talk also about uh, the wildlife uh, consumption, uh, the wildlife meat consumption. And here you have two different contexts. Here I just want to show you one example on the wildlife industry uh, uh, business in China. The data I was a bit old now uh, before COVID in 2016. That is a business of about 73 billion US dollar a year and employing uh, uh, about 14 million people. Of course, after, after COVID, a lot of things changing in terms of policy in China and in Southeast Asia, where people really enjoy uh, the consumption of, of wildlife. Here's a wildlife farming product, and is a kind of, of, of uh, high value. But it shows also the com complex uh, systems of how people are exposed to uh, uh, an, uh, animal uh, uh, farming, uh, but also with consumption and also contact leading to the spinover of disease eventually in this context. or also wildlife, but here you can see different contexts of the bush meat consumption linked to the food insecurity during COVID, for example, many people in Africa face uh, the food insecurity situation. So they poach animals, they consume wildlife uh, uh, meat and that's, that's also another context of uh, uh, bush meat consumption uh, uh, leading also to the high risk of spinover of uh, infectious disease. So to, to deal with this uh, complex health issue of uh, uh, immersion and re-emergence of infectious diseases, uh, we agree that one health is one of the approach that we need to promote. And I would say that, you know, uh, we have different understanding on this uh, one health approach. It becomes also very fashionable recently, but we have some uh, kind of defin definition uh, that we can refer and we agree how that approach can be applied. Uh, to deal with this complex health issue. And one of these things, I think that now people refer to the definition of the One Health High Level, high level Expert, uh, uh, OLEP, in 2021, and that was actually endorsed by a quadripartite, and very happy to see also UNEP joining this uh, uh, tripartite in promoting One Health. Um, so, when you look at this new definition of, of, of One Health by OLEP, that can be very broad. It can be anything promoting the inter, inter sector of collaboration to improve uh, the health of people, animal, and, and, and the environment. But it talked a lot on, uh, about the disciplines. It talked a lot about the connection between society and science and so on. That can be linked to water pollution, to air pollution, climate change, and health. But I think that this important thing for us is really to put the one health is in the context of immersion and re-immersion of infectious disease leading to the pandemic and actually the interrelationship between uh, wildlife, livestock, 
uh, human and the environment is important in this discussion. So, so in most of the people, uh, we recognize the benefits of One Health approach. And I, I would cite here five things among others that can help, uh, uh, the, that can promote the sharing resources. And from that, you can achieve a better efficiency and effectiveness, and you can save uh, uh, money financially uh, in terms of uh, resource, but also to save uh, uh, human life and, 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 and animals and animal life. Uh, it helps to control diseases in the animal reservoir rather than human victims. So that is actually uh, linked to our discussion today on early detection, early prevention. Uh, this, this can help the early detection and management of emerging threats. But in particular, uh, in Caesar, you know, the pandemic will come, uh, the one health approach will help to de-risk the drivers of disease emergence. And finally, that generate insight and added values uh, uh, among sectors and discussion in, in, in different you know, contexts, science, society, policy making uh, process. Uh, this data is not updated, but actually the trend and the model uh, is always applied for, for, for the current situation. This is actually the publication from, from the World Bank uh, showing that the cost of control of outbreak is always and much higher than the cost of prevention uh, on the upstreams in the process of emergence or uh, spinover and, and, and re-emergence of, uh, of, of disease. And actually, 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 this is a very important point we want to make in uh, a different context because here you can see that you know the control of endemic diseases before they get into people is always efficient in terms of cost benefit analysis. All this experience in the past showing, for example, in the history major zoonosis uh, uh, control in animal reservoir actually uh, is much more efficient when it jumps into, in, into, in, in, into human. As the case of you know, salmonella, salmonellosis control in Denmark uh, have also saved a lot of money or you know, very classic uh, one hell uh, model on rabies. We celebrated rabies day a few weeks ago, uh, uh, you know, promoting very much the, the mass vaccination of dogs uh, combined with the post exposure treatment is most, much more uh, effective than the post uh, uh, exposure treatment alone and, and, and so on and so forth as the uh, uh, publication showing this, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, advantage of early uh, prevention uh, of infectious diseases. Or for the current context of uh, COVID-19, various source estimates that it costs us about 10 to 20 trillion US dollar. So that is actually the cost of 10 years of endemic zoonosis cost, uh, according to some analysis. And actually, if we have the strategy, we need to work together applying One Health, you can see how much we can save in terms of uh, you know, prevention uh, and, and control of, of these uh, diseases. So this is this, uh, the context of uh, 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 infectious disease and the pandemics. And now it leads me uh, to the second part of this talk to give some thought about how to foster the multilateral collaboration uh, to implement the disease prevention strategies. And actually it goes very much in the, in the context of prison uh, that my, I personally like it very much because uh, you know, started with the French group, you could initiate this initiative, but also very happy to see more and more preserve can in, embrace the known uh, uh, French partners in this discussion. And of course, the advantage of this uh, initiative is in fact, you could really achieve very high level advocacy like you can see here uh, uh, to really promote uh, uh, the One Health uh, approach we, we are talk, talking about. Uh, and of course, this, the change of the uh, paradigm uh, to really looking very much on the upstreams on intervention and the bottom up approach uh, to prevent the early uh, spinover instead of you know, the control of the pandemics on, 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 on the, yeah, uh, the downstream side. That is really the concept of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of PISO. So, so I would see a few things here. Uh, to, to, to strengthen this uh, approach of One Health and you know, fa uh, facilitate and also 
uh, strengthens the intersectoral collaboration. Uh, uh, I would say, you know, first of all, we need more understanding about science related to One Health. You know, all these things understand the drivers, emissions of diseases, understand the mechanism of disease transmission, in, uh, but even the social aspect of One Health. We talked a lot about livelihood, or we talked about the behavior change linked to One Health, that is important. So we need more uh, data linked to science. Of course, you know, we cannot say that, you know, we, we do research and we need data and we need more data. We always have to do something with the data and the evidence we have, but we still need to produce more evidence. So I'm from CGIR system. We are working on promoting the science linked to One Health. So we have a various a project and program going on with the entries of wildlife and livestock linked to human health. And actually some of the preserved partners are part of this thing. For example, the capacity thing, One Health in Eastern and Southern Africa, Coheza project funded by OACPS, or uh, the One Health Center in Africa funded by BMZ, or the One Health Initiative I'm leading uh, with CJR, very much focusing on science uh, of One Health. The second point I would see is in fact, you know, we do science, but we need to do it at the same time to really to, to, uh, to strengthen the capacity of One Health at national levels. And now luckily enough that most of the country in Global South, they have set up the One Health platform or One Health Directorate or One Health Coordination Mechanism, whatever the, the name they call, they already bring different ministries together to talk about One Health. You have here a sample from Vietnam, uh, on one health partnership to control zoonosis, or here the zoonotic are one health, but the capacity are quite still limited, but global and international initiative need to support this high level of one health. But this is not enough to support the national level because you have a lot of talking at the high level, but little happening on the ground in terms of one health. And I think that we need to strengthen the One Health implementation on the ground by promoting, for example, developing different lab, One Health lab on, 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 on in the field. You know, here we have some good example from Vietnam, for example, we developed the One Health Research Partnership site at the provincial level where you can policy makers at local level, university, lecturer, students, but also in particular community to talk and to deal with specific One Health example here, for example, zoonotic disease in Vietnam. We can strengthen this capacity at the county or the local level. Here in Kenya, for example, we, all, we have developed the fin site in a, a different uh, county here in Western, uh, Northern, and also Southern uh, Kenya, here in uh, uh, Kajiado County, for example. Here, as you know, we, we, we develop a, a fin site with a lab facility so that people can work on the crowd on data collection and some simple uh, uh, lab treatment before sending uh, these samples uh, to a more advanced lab in Nairobi or in other place. Uh, we need to develop the capacity of the next generation of One Health uh, uh, practices. So, so mostly from university level, but also uh, from the community. So many organizations working on this, uh, uh, for example, the One Health a network uh, in Africa and, and, and Asia are doing very well this job. And another idea is about One Health coordination. Many people doing One Health, having different understanding on One Health, like I said from the beginning here, for example, in Africa. I remember from the last preserve meeting earlier this year, our colleague from European Commission saying something like we have about 200 One Health initiatives or project in Africa. And, and that we need to work more uh, uh, on this coordination to uh, have a better mechanism to achieve better impact. And finally, I think that, you know, the intersector collaboration to promote the implementation of disease prevention strategies is really linked to the discussion among sectors and human need to sit together. Unfortunately, COVID prevents us to, to, to meet in person. But this example of uh, uh, the work of CIRAT and other organization in Southeast Asia when we work on One Health. Uh, here is actually the example of football diseases, very relevant to One Health as well. And we could, uh, uh, we could bring people from different sectors. You can see here 
that decision making people, the public health people, vet people, scientists, community, teachers, even army, they, they are interested in health to discuss specific one health relevant topics. And of course, that is not about the discussion alone. We need the investment in terms of funding. And, and I see that in our global uh, community are very strong at the moment to promote this in developing countries. But I see also the developing country need also invest themselves in promoting this uh, prevention of diseases and one health approach. And in the context of COVID-19, it shows nicely the intersectoral collaboration. For example, here, we uh, as the Animal Health or Livestock Research Institute, we have, uh, uh, we use a capacity to help Kenyan government to uh, analyze a lot of COVID samples and doing genomics uh, uh, and, and so on. But finally, uh, uh, that is also important on the interaction of science and politics. You know, the, the question of origin of uh, the COVID-19, is it not clear? But I see that the science and the politics interface sometimes is uh, difficult to, to reach the consensus or is agreement to move forward to understand more the origin of these diseases. So it's a bit... Uh, uh, various thought uh, uh, from my side uh, to promote the uh, collaboration between sector to improve uh, One Health implementation. Uh, I hope that you know this can bring some thought for our discussion in the next uh, hour or so. Thank you very much uh, for the attention. Thank you so much, uh, Hang, for this uh, excellent introduction uh, to the context that surrounds the emergence of the infectious diseases and how we can uh, foster the collaborations to implement the prevention strategies. I, I was really, um, I really appreciated that you could show this continuum between research, uh, innovation, uh, monitoring, uh, uh, and uh, public policies, but also capacity building, institutional building. All this is really needed and essential. So now we have time for a short uh, session of questions and answers. So uh, who would like to start with the first uh, question? I have a question to start uh, things uh, for you, Hang Zen. It's about uncertainties. Uh, I think in this uh, domain, uh, we still have a lot to learn. And there are many uncertainties. So how can we deal with uncertainties when we design our strategies for surveillance, for instance? Thank you very much, Jean-François, for, for the question. Um, of course, you know, this is area we need to deal with uncertainties, you know. Uh, the risk assessment is key in this process. Uh, but we, we need always, uh, we need uh, always, uh, uh, you know, do the job. And we need to take into account the, the, the uncertainty uh, because if you don't do anything, you know the, the, the result even worse. So, so we, we actually have have to do that. But but I but I think that you know this uncertainty from a scientific uh, point of view is is quite clear in the sense that you know we can come up with model and we we, we predict and we we we, uh, we we present uncertainties. But that need on the, 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 the I think that's the more important point uh, uh, from that side. Really, is that uncertainty need to be really understood and take into a, take into account from the policy making uh, process. And that sometimes I see I, I see the gap there. And I also understand that you know the, the policy makers when they make uh, uh, decision, it's not about the science. The science are not the only input in the matrix they they are doing. So 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 I think that you know we we can do our best with uncertainty we have. But that needs to be more importantly uh, uh, understood and, and taken into account by, by policymaker in the risk management process. Thank you. So to, to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand electronically or just uh, um, unmute and, and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, Natalie. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I was wondering, as you were talking about the uh, uh, cross-sectorial uh, uh, approach and uh, some of the project project that you show, like Coma Cross, uh, as it's um, a project that is already finished, can you give us some of the results and uh, some of the success of this uh, intersectorial approach? 
Thank you, uh, Natalie, for the question. Actually, come, come across is a project, uh, the One Health uh, project funded by EU at that time, and it's finished already. And uh, it was very much uh, on the capacity building uh, 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 side, I think, uh, uh, on One Health in, in Southeast Asia. Um, I had the pleasure also to, <laughs> to do the evaluation at the end of, of the project. So it's finished a few years ago already. But some of the highlights, in fact, you see, um, I think that you now thanks to this come across uh, project, uh, the one health approach uh, could be uh, could be understood by actually some government uh, sectors in within the countries. So so very much in Laos and Cambodia, for example, or even in Vietnam, the, the one health is very much championed by the agriculture sector, by by the vet, uh, by animal health sectors. And thanks to this type of project, we have more workshop, we facilitate people to meet. And you know, we can uh, create more engagement from public health and the environment sector people. I think that you know, uh, now I, my observation is in fact, you now the public health people, they are more and more engaging, but the missing piece is really the environment sector so, so that need to be done. And, and finally, uh, uh, beyond health environment and 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 uh, and and, and uh, agriculture or, or, or animal health, uh, the social science also the social science and the humanities uh, also start you know taking up the one health approach in some of the discussion, and and we observe it uh, we observe this progress uh, it progressed but it's slowly uh, <laughs> slower than than what we expect but this is important step to really engage different uh, partners together. And finally, I, I just want to finish. We come across, I think that one of the good outcome is really is the education of next generation. I think it's the master of interest uh, they develop, not myself, I, I teach for them. But uh, that, that give a kind of legacy really to bring many uh, um, graduate students in the region to work on One Health and some of them become kind of really a champions in some of the country in Southeast Asia. Thank you. So we, we have a question uh, from uh, Pastor Alonso. If you'd like to ask your question, uh, would you like to ask your question or should I read it? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, um, my pleasure. I, I would like to know uh, more about the, the role that could be the integrated civilian in reducing the, the risk of these are threats, and also what is the state uh, of the integrated civilian at the world level or a initiative that could be working on that? Thanks. Uh, you need to unmute, uh, Hang. Oh, sorry, I, I was muted. Um, okay, thank, thank you for the question. If you ask this uh, integrated surveillance uh, linked to prisons, so I need to uh, send this question to, uh, to, to uh, the, the core group of prisons, in particular, uh, Benjamin and, and, uh, and Jean-Francois. But uh, generally speaking, in, in my talk, I think that you know, promoting the integrated surveillance of diseases is important in the sense that you see, uh, you see most of the, the, the infectious diseases um, or the pandemic, uh, we people detect it or, or you know attract attention when it comes to human only. So, so, so in, in that sense, it's already late or even too late uh, to apply the, the, the one health approach with this you know upstream upstream prevention. So, so that's why developing an integrated surveillance of health, putting animal health, human health together, would increase the, the, the chance to detect early the disease before they, they, they jump into human. And at the moment, you know, uh, we have a few good uh, uh, examples or model uh, uh, for that. For example, you know, in Thailand, a colleague from Chiang Mai University developed a animal health and human health integration uh, uh, surveillance systems using mobile phone, for example. So they, yeah, the, the, the animal health workers and pub, or pub, uh, public health workers or, or even farmers they send the photo of different uh, uh, symptoms, early symptoms, so that you know we can uh, they can develop a database uh, of uh, 
uh, of the diseases and you know advice and you know detect earlier uh, uh, from animal health animal side before it jump to the human. Uh, of course, you know for the new disease it's more complicated, but this show very much the value how the integration of uh, animal and, and and human health surveillance is uh, making sense in the current context. 